So, September 9, 1993, is a day that resonates with me because it's a day I'll never forget. You see, it's the day this 18-year-old kid landed in Boston, Massachusetts. He's with a dream, you know, he's, he's, uh, he landed to this country that, where he had a dream of envisioning of becoming. And ladies and gentlemen, at 18 years old, he had reached. To me, it was like one of those things where you say, um, I can't wait to meet Fresh Prince. <laughs> you know, hang out with Dr. Dre, Snoop, Tupac, Biggie, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> But my friends, you know, uh, reality checked in real quick, eh? And I figured, or rather I found out, that the closest I would get to those jamas is by literally trying to imitate how they dress. So, my name is Nixon Merore. Um, I grew up in Rero, a small town then, uh, in the outskirts of Nairobi. But as my friends here remind me, at that time, it wasn't a town. It was a stage. <laughs> when I get here, my parents were going to fund me for the first one year of school. So, and then after that, like my relatives who had gotten here before me, I was supposed to find a job and then make it work. And about five, six months in, I haven't found a job yet because I'm still good. But then, I realized, crap, I'm just removing, I have nothing coming in, so I have to look for a job. So eight months in my stay here, um, I decided, uh, you know, things were getting picked now. I mean, like, you know, reality was really hitting. You know, it was no waking up in the morning and getting eggs done. You had to get the eggs, whatever, you know, and all that. So um, I wake up this day, I say, all right, let me find this job. So I'm talking to my friends, they're like, oh yeah, you know, we do these jobs up in Boston at that point, we're doing these jobs you do, um, you, you either become a security guard, and it's like six bucks an hour, it's a lot of money, man, or if you really have the heart, you go do a CNA course, you become a nursing assistant. Uh, Nixon started his first official job the next week at McDonald's, flipping burgers <laughs> at $4.25 an hour with a 50 cents differential because I used to be a closer. <laughs> yani, as we like to say, have you ever seen life, Yani, just pinduka? You just flip on you. It's like, yo, this is not what I signed up for. But the reality is here. 4.35, you have to go to school, you have to pay rent, you have to buy your own eggs, and everything else that came with it. This is from a 19-year-old kid who finished high school, stayed home for seven months, and then was put in a plane and shipped to the United States of America. Because one, it was a family pride, and two, for all those who lived in the early 90s, if you got an opportunity to get out, you are told, literally, and I quote my dad, he can tell you this, even my mom says, you go and don't come back. <laughs> get everybody else to come and do what? 425, rent, school, and everything else. So at that age, we start building, I started getting anxiety attacks, like, you know, pressure attacks, like, how am I going to make this work? There is all this pressure between home, are you going to school? How are classes? Did you make the dean's list? See, this is a problem of growing up in primary school and high school and being number one, number two. You expected to, you know, it's a carry-on, right? So, these things now are coming back to bite me. Long story short, I realized pretty quick that that wasn't going to do it. But there was no outlet. We didn't have one. The Form 6 guys, like I'm telling you, used to look at us like kids who don't know what the hell they're doing. 
And then we were a bunch of us, of these eight four Jamaas who just landed stay two right, in Boston, and we're trying to figure ourselves out. So there was a very big drop in a lot of things. School is very expensive in Boston. So some guys decided, yo, you, I'm from Keno, okay? <laughs> I ain't going back to that school. I can't afford to pay it, but if I can work doubles and triples, then maybe I can, you know, somebody, I can help my family and do something like that. So now everybody started taking different ventures. There are those who did that. There are the, those who fell into like serious depression. I lost a couple of my friends to suicide. So, okay. So there's a bunch of us who, me and the Kenor guy, we are not going back, right? So we have to make it work. Um, and we struggled, we struggled with that. So pressures, you know, you would go to school one semester, you would drop off, go work, do this, do that, the other. In the meantime, there is also the pressure from the parents. Are you still going to school? You can't tell them you're not going to school, right? Because everybody who was there before you, again, seven, five years older than you, had made it work. But you don't, you don't, you didn't have any, there's no book, there's no guide you're given. This is going to stay to figure it out. So, we end up um, continuing, you know, hooking up between ourselves as a group, support group, and the support group became, uh, our, you know, we turned into alcohol, because there's no way you're chopping doubles, two, three, four, five doubles in a week. This paycheck comes and you're like, you guy, 40 ounces is like $2. It ain't gonna turn. <laughs> and we became pretty good at that stuff. But you see, it was eating us from inside. At least for myself, it was really eating me from inside. Because I knew better. I knew that is not what I was destined for. And you don't want to lose the fact that it's an opportunity you've been given to come to this country. But at that point, it's all right. All I'm going to do is I'm not going to call home for like six months. And then, you know, I'll figure something out within those six months. So pressure, everything, anger, resentment, you just, it, all these things are building in. Finally, one day, huh, I had a roommate. So I go home, I think I just like done a double or something. I'm just one of those days you just don't want to talk to anybody. And I get this guy goes like, yo, Nick, like for real, you think you have a boat over here? And you left dishes here, what, what were you thinking? That, that's all it took. the pressure cooker valve went off. It got physical and it got pretty, pretty, pretty bad because it was literally an ambush. And were it not for our neighbor who used to live downstairs, my, the apartment that I used to live <clears throat> downstairs, she, she was sleeping, she had the commotion, she came out, she was a Kenyan. Were it not for her, the authorities would have been involved. And if they were, who would have been involved then, I wouldn't be here telling you this story. I know for a fact I would have done, I would have done some jail time. So I walked into school the next day, um, University of Massachusetts, I'll never forget, counseling department. And I told them, guys, uh, Ikoshida Hapa. And, um, for some reason, remember I told you, I never call, you know, you go six months, whatever, right? My parents are like, no. My mom had this, you, as a parent, you always have this intuition, something is wrong. And because he's not saying, let's go find out what's going on. So during that time, my parents happened to come to the US to visit. And uh, so, I, I mean, I was like, you know what, come and buy Amba. If my dad is gonna start beating me up again, you know, like disciplining me, we're in state two, I can at least help her, he won't know where I go, you know, he's new here, so, you know, I can lose him easy. <laughs> so my, my parents listened to my story and they, they actually were very, very remorseful. They, they, they were very, they, they were very pivotal in helping me make this transition. And, the re, and I remember words my mom always told me, she said, Nick, there is always, there is always room for change. 
you can always start afresh. So I'm like, I, so, so you really don't care, and you haven't gone to school for like a couple months, and it comes in. No, we don't. We're, really, we're here to help you focus. Focus, and you'll be okay. It has taken me a long time and courage and vulnerability, you know, to, you know, tell the story. But why am I doing it? You see, in the last two years, in just the U.S. alone, at least of the ones that I have able to keep track, we've had 30 deaths to suicide. And at least half, if not slightly more half than that, are ages between 18 and 25. Now, these are kids that I have gone for baby showers, birthdays, graduations, and here I am at the funeral. Were it not for, I guess the preferring moment, if you want to call it that, that made me realize, or even my parents coming in and having that here, or even figuring out that I needed help to do something, I would have been part of that statistic at that age group. So the question is this, I understand the cultural differences, and I really do. And I understand, you know, the way we grew up. We are having kids here, and we are trying to enforce that that we know to them. By doing that, these kids have pressure of their own. And I'm going somewhere with this. When I started doing that research and trying to figure out what, you know, what was going on, what can we do as a community? In Boston, I, I started working with community groups. And we had these sessions where we sat kids down. Completely no judgment. We would tell the parents to bring the kids and all that stuff. The parents would go, uka. The toys would stay this side, give them flyers, fill in paperwork, and then, and the, the amount of pressure on our children, ladies and gentlemen, is unreal. These kids have identity crisis because, like somebody said, sometimes they are too American for Kenyans, they are too Kenyan for Americans, and they have no identity. You know, I have my flaws. So be it, everybody does. However, I have kids that are approaching that age. And it would break my heart to think that my son or, I, you know, or any of the kids that I know now will continue adding into these statistics. I would have been that statistic. I am here to tell the story because somebody believed in me or somebody told me you need help, you need to take care of ABC. So as, a, as Nixon Murray, I'm, here, I'm still finding myself. As a father though, I come to you, not with any solutions, but with questions on one, who are our kids using as an outlet? If you're a parent, who does your child use in a, as, a, as an outlet? And leave alone the child. Let's start with you. Don't be afraid. Don't. 
if you feel and you know somebody who may need to see somebody or what they say now, if you see something, say something. Ladies and gentlemen, let's engage and keep this conversation going. Thank you.